driving is no pleasure in this sort of thing. I suppose all the noise and strains and frustration are necessary. After all, I'm in the mechanical age, and so I'd better put up with it. And it has its advantages. Shut up, you neurotic ass. It has its advantages, for it makes the motor cars and the comforts of life, but the noisier the world grows in the cities, the more precious I find the places of tranquility and permanence. This island isn't big and it's very overcrowded. Muddle like this makes me long for bird song instead of traffic roar, flower smells instead of fumes. In the end, this road will take me to Cornwall, to North Cornwall, where I was brought up as a child, and to a part of it which has been kept in its natural state, not by the government or by any private landlord, but by the National Trust. Cornwall to be seen at walking pace. Now there's time to breathe and see and smell and hear. Spring is the best time in Cornwall, when the hedges and turf are like acres of wild rock garden, when sea pinks colour the cliffs for miles. There's always a breeze on these heights. It's only in the lanes in between the high hedges that you can get out of it. And even then, there is wind enough to blow a gate shut. I remember the consternation there was when this piece of headland, Pentire, came up for sale. But local people subscribed to buy it and gave it to the National Trust, so that it is now an open space forever, for all to enjoy. But it's not a useless open space. The National Trust owns Pentire Farm, the old farmhouse on the left, and the newer house, in simple storm-resisting style, is already like the farm buildings, spotted with orange and silver lichens, which grow where winds are salt. Farmers, with the good Cornish name of Olds, have looked after this land for generations and made a living from it. Their pasture and yards are sheltered from the great Atlantic gales. They are snug in a hollow of this windswept peninsula. Cornish father and Cornish son. The edges of their farm are wild and wonderful, with the Atlantic Ocean tumbling all around them. Huge cliffs have hidden paths to secret caves, once only known to smugglers, and where only seagulls dare to go today. And only seals can safely bask in these merciless waters, which are angry looking even in the calmest weather. The rocks are blue with mussels. The rock pools hold limpets and crabs, and their shattered remains strew the cliffs, dropped from the beaks of seabirds. Birds like the oyster catcher, sailing there from peak to peak among the topmost pinnacles of Pentire Point. <laughs> Mole Island and the Rumps. Here, on this outermost edge of the Celtic Kingdom of Cornwall, it is thought that some race earlier than the Celts made a last stand before being driven backwards into the sea, for there are traces of forts here and of pit dwellings. After such ancient and wild grandeur, I like a sudden and complete contrast of scene. Let's choose Claydon, near Aylesbury. The National Trust has owned it for less than five years. The Vernies, who gave it to them, have lived in this mild and pastoral part of Buckinghamshire for 500 years. The house you see was built by the second Lord Verney in 1752, plain outside, but immensely luxurious within. Lord Verney was a genial spendthrift and a man of taste. He employed his friend Sir Thomas Robinson, a Yorkshire landowner turned architect, to design this spacious saloon with a ceiling by the famous stuccoist Joseph Rose. But wait, see the contrast these chaste grey walls provide with the room which adjoins it and which we are going to enter now.
Here, Lord Verney employed a decorator named Lightfoot, about whom nothing is known except that he was thought to be a little mad. The walls have been coloured that Neapolitan yellow to show up the marvellous white carving with which Lightfoot decorated chimney piece, niches and door frame. He called it all his naturalistic style, and the sober architect Robinson didn't like it at all, though I must say I like it myself very much. The Great Staircase at Claydon is one of the wonders of the late Georgian age. It goes up three storeys, the whole height of the house. Here, Lightfoot was again given a chance and showed his skill in joinery. The mahogany stairs are inlaid with rosewood, satinwood, ebony and ivory. Not just underneath and at the sides, but on the treads of the stairs as well. And up those stairs, a century ago, Florence Nightingale must have walked, for her sister married one of the Vernies, and she often came and stayed here. The ironwork has metal ears of corn attached to it. And every time anyone goes up the stairs, the vibration sets the corner shaking right up to the top of the house. And perhaps it's the ghost of Florence Nightingale which makes them shake now. In an upstairs room is the most fantastic of all the wonders Claydon has to show. At this time, 1760, China was all the rage. Chinese patterns, Chinese figures, and things like the pagoda in Kew Gardens. Lord Verney had his own pagoda, carved by Lightfoot in the Chinese room. All this carving is of wood, painted to look like plaster. It's the sort of thing Chippendale used to do to the frames of looking glasses and pictures. It's Chippendale only more so. And as we pass under this wild extravaganza with its brackets and leaves and little wooden temple bells, we find a mandarin and his wife carved on the ceiling to welcome us to tea. After art, nature. Wiccan Fen, Cambridgeshire, which the Trust keeps as a nature reserve. You might think this mere flooded to attract waterfowl and these fringes of reeds growing out of two feet of water were dull dull until you look at Wiccan Fen in detail, a windmill water pump. Once, these were all over the fens. Reeds grow out of water, but the sedge you see here grows in swamp. Bushes would invade the sedge if it weren't cut every year. The dense stems, where sedge warblers have precarious nests, are tall, and if left uncut, they rot and form soil which bushes grow on. Before corrugated iron was invented, reeds like these, with their round stems and the more pliable sedge, were used for thatching. The village post office at Wiccan has reeds for the smooth part of its roof and sedge which bends for the ridges. And here's another Wiccan cottage, thatched only with sedge. The swallowtail butterfly flitting about here, once bred naturally in the fens. But modern farming and drainage and various other things did it in, until it was reintroduced to Wiccan Fen, which is kept by the Trust in its natural state. And there it thrives. The fen is bright with flowers. In summer, purple loose strife and the creamy meadow sweet abound, and the reed mace scattering its pollen like powder a whole area as a nature reserve. A whole area of lilies, loads and mirrors and marshes. That's one sort of trust property. And as a contrast, another trust property is a whole area of houses, a complete village. Laycock in Wiltshire was once a wool town. In medieval times, the main bath road went through it. Then its neighbours, Chippenham and Trowbridge, became more important. But Laycock, under the ownership of the Talbot family, was kept intact. I like touring slowly through the streets, noticing details.
That doorway, for instance, Corsham Stone. And from those carved Swiss rolls on the porch, I should think the date is Queen Anne. And the door scraper is to match where a wool worker must have scraped his shoes about two centuries ago. Old and practical, like this window catch, which is probably Elizabethan. The thick timber which supports this house is about 1380, and it's been filled in with brick and stone later. Of course, one's so used to fake half timber, it's hard to believe the genuine. Yet one knows that's genuine, just as are the plants in the window. Laycock isn't a self-conscious show place. Although the post office and the other shops fit in with their surroundings, yet they're practical and they're used. This door must have been there for at least 400 years. It's Tudor. And look at those fern leaves in the wooden spandrel of the arch. Stone was used at Laycock as easily as wood, for walls and roofs and for doorways. And beyond this stone buttress is the blacksmith's shop, which is now used as a bus shelter. The attraction of Laycock is that it is complete as a unit. Though the houses are all of different dates and styles and materials, they all fit in together. Gabled cottages of the 17th century look perfectly at home beside the plainer houses of the early 19th. And now they'll all be kept in good condition forever because the Talbot family who owned the village and other voluntary subscribers have handed the place over to the National Trust with endowments for its upkeep. The four little streets of Laycock are unconscious planning. English people once knew by instinct how to make a street exactly right. And as a contrast with this, the gardens of Stour Head, which are man-made landscape, are a piece of conscious planning. Originally, where we are walking now was a bare hollow in the downs on the Wiltshire Dorset borders. The little stream in the valley was dammed in 1741 to make a lake. Henry Hoare, its owner of Hawes Bank, London, planted trees and built temples and grottoes on its shore so that every step you took should present a picture. His idea was to have the pictures he had collected on his grand tour of the continent as a young man brought to life in his own Wiltshire Valley. His descendants, who gave these gardens to the trust, belonged to the late Victorian age which liked flowering shrubs, such as azaleas and rhododendrons, while, of course, their ancestor, Henry Hoare, had preferred the more classic scene, with water in the foreground and a temple in the middle distance. Thus, Starhead has become two gardens in one, a classic landscape garden of Georgian times and a late Victorian garden of blossoming shrubs. In spring, the two combine and make the lines of an 18th century poet about Starhead still hold good. Throughout the various scenes, above, below, lawns, walks and slopes, with verdant carpets glow. On the clear mirror float the inverted shades of woods, plantations, wildernesses, glades, rocks, bridges, temples, grottoes and cascades. A landscape garden has to be laid out by an artist. That at Starhead is the work of two, the planter of the flowering shrubs and the designer of the classic temples. And here the one is a setting for the other. And the old church of Stoughton village at the head of the valley reminds us of the age before landscape gardening was invented. From man-made scenery to the natural, Honister Pass Cumberland, the Trust owns 30,000 acres in the Lake District. And I've often wondered what it is that has made these fells and streams and crags of Cumberland, Westmoreland and Lancashire the playground of the Midlands and the North. I can't believe that it's because they've read Wordsworth that these boys bathe here and incidentally defile the grass with their litter 
I wish they'd put it in the basket that's been provided for them. Why do people come in their thousands every summer? And why, despite their tents and their caravans, does the scenery always prevail and seem big enough to hold them? The crags, though some of them may be difficult enough to climb, and this isn't a particularly difficult one you're looking at now, Shepherd's Crag near Derwent Water, the crags are nothing like so adventurous as those to be found in the much larger and wilder mountains of Wales. So why, I ask myself, is the Lake District the most rambled over, scrambled over, camped over and admired and loved of all the natural scenery of England? Wordsworth knew. It's because everything here is of the right scale. The lakes themselves are all middle size, not too big so that you can't see across them, yet obviously not ponds. And it's also because they're full of variety, both on their shores and skylines. How pleasing, he said, to watch the stream pushing its way among the rocks in lively contrast with the stillness from which it has escaped. An effect of size is not gained by magnitude, but by proportion. Here on Crummock Water, where you can usually catch a pike, all seems large enough. But it's the trees at the edge and the fold of the hills beyond which give variety. It's the fields down to the shore which give friendliness to Derwent water. And a circle of stones 3,000 years old which give mystery to the hills. Over 50 years ago, here in the Lake District, Brandlehow was bought by public subscription. It was one of the first properties of the National Trust, which now owns over a thousand properties in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. St Michael's Mount in Cornwall was a gift from its owner, Lord St Leven. Lanhydrock, with its woods, 17th century gatehouse and formal gardens, was given by Lord Clifton. And what do you do with a great country house like Cot Hill if you inherit it and like it and can't afford to keep it up? Rather than let it become a ruin, anything. A 15th century Cornish manor, it was accepted by the treasury in lieu of death duties from Lord Mount Edgecombe. And the treasury handed it on to the trust. But the National Trust is not a government department. It's a voluntary body for saving beautiful places. Ickworth, the Georgian Suffolk house of the Marquis of Bristol, is another gift from the Treasury in lieu of death duties. It was built by the Lord Bristol who was Bishop of Derry in the late 18th century. Blickling Hall, Norfolk, with its 25 farms and the money to keep it up, was left to the trust by the will of the 11th Lord Lothian. However the properties come, by will or public subscription, or as in the case of Oxborough Hall, Norfolk, partly as a personal gift from a member of the family which has lived here for four and a half centuries, however the properties come, the idea is to keep these places as going concerns which are open to the public. And it's not always houses and landscape which the trust preserves. Avebury in Wiltshire is the biggest prehistoric temple in Britain about 1500 BC. This was bought with money given by the Pilgrim Trust and a private subscriber. Small manor houses, this is the one at Tintinhull, Somerset, are as attractive as big country houses. I don't know what it is that makes this garden so pleasant and peaceful and so obviously not looked after by a public authority, but there it is loved and cared for and personal. The lady who created this garden still lives in a modest early 18th century manor house, that at Tintin Howe, as a tenant of the National Trust to whom she gave it. There is a house which is lived in, 
enjoyed and welcoming. When the tenant leaves a house, the soul goes out of it. Look on this picture and on this. Without the trust, an essential and irreplaceable part of our rapidly diminishing national heritage of what is beautiful and old will go forever to decay the devil and the demolition man. <laughs>